<clears throat> welcome, oh, welcome everyone, welcome. Um, on this first really uh, summer kind of weekend. So thank you everyone for coming out today from far and near. I'm uh, Charlotte von Robert, the, one of the co-directors of the Taubi Center for Jewish Studies. Um, we have people from the East Coast, from Canada and New York, who made the trek over here, um, but especially our colleagues from Europe, who had to overcome uh, special travel challenges uh, posed by an unpronounceable volcano this time. Thank you for making it here. So um, I'm, <laughs> I'm happy that all of you made it. And uh, before we introduce very briefly the symposium as a whole, uh, and then tonight's speaker, who will present the opening talk, I wanted to start with the thank yous for making this symposium possible, uh, contra the Hollywood uh, practice, I guess, when it comes at the end. But then I keep forgetting, so I'll start with it. Um, so first and foremost, I want to uh, thank our two administrators in the office at the Center for Jewish Studies, Linda Huin, who's in the back there, hiding, uh, our office manager with her uh, tremendous organizational skills and a sense for the doable that keeps overly nervous scholar types like myself in line uh, and provides a backbone uh, on many fronts and Ruth Tarnopolsky, uh, our events manager who has been in touch with many of you, uh, especially those of you from beyond Stanford campus to get you settled and uh, transported and fed. Uh, without their tireless efforts, this would not, would not have come together. Uh, the above mentioned unpronounceable volcano, I tried a couple of times, but then I decided to, to uh, drop it. In Iceland, did not help the cause last week. There were several nervous breakdowns, uh, nor did the fact uh, that this weekend is also admin weekend at Stanford, which we found out later. Uh, so the unpredictable and the predictable, uh, they both mastered beautifully, so thank you both. Uh, we also thank the Gristel Fund, uh, fund for making this, uh, this uh, conference possible by underwriting uh, much of the funding for what turned out to be a very interdisciplinary sym symposium. Um, and I also want to thank the co-sponsoring centers and programs here, first and foremost, the Center for Comparative, for the Comparative Study of Race and Ethnicity, with whom Jewish Studies is affiliated here at Stanford and whose building we share, and where Jewish Studies for the first time in, in Stanford history has gotten a room of its own. Uh, beyond the office spaces. spaces. So from the beginning the, uh, of the planning stages of this symposium, we wanted this to be something that would be an expression and representation of our collaboration with CCSRE. So Stanford, as I think any campus in the US, has lots of acronyms. It's not like that in Germany, but um, CCSRE is the Center for Comparative Study of Race and Ethnicity. So I want to say something also about uh, the uh, African and African American Studies um, program in a second, which uh, is co-sponsoring tonight's talk. But I will do that at the introduction for Arto Kaison later. Uh, so two more individuals I want to thank, which is um, my co-director, Vera Chemtov, who has much better organizational talents than I do and who has been a great supporter along the way always. And I also especially, and therefore last, want to thank Devin Nair, the co-convener of this symposium, who is a graduate student in the Department of History and is everything that one can hope for in a graduate student. Not mine, unfortunately, but um, we, we work together. Uh, Devin came to me initially a few years uh, back since both of us have shared interest in, um, in space and spatial frameworks for the making of collective identities. And we've had many conversations over the past years. And I'm afraid that in the end, I learned more from him than he did from me. And in that sense, he has been what in the Talmud and in Jewish cultural history has been referred to as a chavruta or as a study partner all along. And I've been very luck lucky to have had the opportunity to work with him. And I also discovered along the way that he is quite multi-talented. And he will say in a few moments uh, something about the poster which he created. 
So uh, this is now done with the thank yous. Um, and now just in very brief, something about the idea behind the symposium, which uh, those of you who we invited to participate know a little bit about, but just um, to introduce um, us all into this, which is, this is how we've described it in brief uh, from the get-go, uh, with the title at home in diaspora, diaspora at home. Uh, diaspora studies has come into its own. Uh, Quad journals and other forms of institutionalization, such as the Center for Diaspora and Transnational Studies in Toronto, uh, once quintessentially associated with the Jewish condition of collective ex existence, particularly after the defeat of the Jewish province by the Roman Empire, it has now become one of the prime paradigms of the study of globalization and its cultural as well as socio-political effects. In a world of increasing migration and simultaneously increasing homelessness, both in a literal and physical sense, as well as in a cultural sense, our understanding of the possibilities and impossibilities of the notion of home and belonging may become more crucial than ever. Hence, the emphasis on home in our title. Our conference seeks to focus on this particular aspect of diaspora studies, which is the question of belonging and home. How are these constituted once home is no longer a given, whether that's due to emigration, immigration, migration, refu uh, uh, refuge, exile, or whichever form of displacement? How do people emplace and replace themselves? How does nostalgia impact the ways in which people constitute themselves in their immediate environment? How have, have and do people relate or have related to the imagined homes by uh, nostalgia or utopian ideas? So we are seeking to create a fruitful interdisciplinary conversation between scholars of Jewish culture, Jewish culture in its various dimensions and other cultures from various disciplinary approaches and perspectives. Our hope is to engage in a conversation about the concepts that we draw in and or the theoretical frameworks we develop in order to study the phenomenon of diaspora. The organizing principle of the conference is the element of scale, as in scales of diaspora existence, uh, experience and spheres of belonging. Uh, the concept of scale has been preeminently important for a number of scholars who study the dynamics of globalization. To us, this is not just a question of the local versus the global, but more concretely the frameworks within which people situate themselves in order to develop a sense of belonging, whether that be the street and neighborhood, the city, the nation, the region, or the transnational dimension. With this framework, we are looking forward to a productive, converse, productive conversation between scholars who may not have necessarily shared, shared the rooms this, the same room otherwise, which we are very much hoping later on to collect into a book to um, share with people outside from this symposium. So thank you, and Devin. Thank you, Charlotte. I'd like to echo her, uh, her welcome, and i um, very pleased to be here with all of you uh, this afternoon, and it's been my pleasure and real, a real honor to work with Charlotte in particular in uh, convening this conference, and um, I'm happy that all of you could join us this afternoon. I wanted to just say um, a few words uh, about the poster um, uh, which, in which I tried to, uh, tried to present some kind of visual representation of some of the themes that, I, that we'll, we'll be discussing um, today and tomorrow. And as the title is of the conference of the symposium is At Home in Diaspora, Diaspora at Home, I was hoping, hoping to present here um, just one of the key organizing principles which uh, Charlotte alluded to, that being scale, the scales of belonging or vectors of identification and play with these themes um, a little bit. And so uh, what I sought to do here uh, in these, uh, these images that I've presented is to consider diaspora not only based upon the dyad of, say, homeland and then diaspora outside of it, but um, also to consider the experiences and representations of home and diaspora on multiple levels, uh, having multiple fulcrums or 
uh, points of intersection and divergence, multiple nexuses. So what I've done here is to try to present in, in, in this one image here uh, something about the, uh, the interaction and juxtaposition between local, national, and global, perhaps also other vectors of belonging. And so basically there are three of these that I've, uh, I've sought to represent here. The, the background image comes from interwar uh, Vilna from the, uh, from the Jewish quarter, which uh, as we'll learn about um, tomorrow, has been understood as a, as, a, as a sort of a Jerusalem of the diaspora. So uh, sort of overturning this notion of the dichotomy between diaspora and homeland and uh, the possibility of considering one at home in what otherwise would be considered um, exile. And so here also is the notion of neighborhood and street. And so what I've done is in the middle of the street or in the middle of this courtyard, I've placed the globe. And so uh, what I've tried to do here is to suggest perhaps a little bit that even uh, the global dimension of one's identity can oftentimes be read through the local and vice versa, that even one's understanding of a cosmopolitan world um, comes through the lens of the local and the particular. And inside of the globe, I've presented us with an open door, which is open into a, uh, a bit of a distorted map, uh, which is a medieval map in which the orientation is quite different from the ones that we would be accustomed to today, in which um, actually it, it didn't appear on this uh, particular sliver, which is, uh, actually represents the Aegean, uh, the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean and the beginnings of, of the, the Levant, the Eastern Mediterranean basin, but sort of from the bottom up. Um, and the, it, the, the point furthest to the top of the map is um, the point furthest to the west, which in this representation was actually Africa. Uh, so it went Africa and then Spain, and then it went, uh, went further, um, further to the east. Um, and so what I've tried to suggest with the notion of the door is that there is some permeability between these three uh, vectors or three layers of belonging and that um, it's the interaction between these as just some examples through which we can, I think, uh, come to um, an interesting, at least I, I hope an interesting or stimulating visual, visual representation of the question of, um, of home and diaspora. And um, so that is all I wanted to share with you on that topic and I uh, welcome you once again and I will turn it once more to Charlotte. Um, well, uh, in theory, I was not, not now supposed to stand here, um, but my colleague, uh, Michelle Elam, uh, from also English, but she's also the director of uh, AAAS, uh, African and African American um, studies. Uh, she could not come because um, her brother-in-law who is, um, which then I found out only through this, was a uh, famous rap and hip hop musician, uh, passed away this week. Um, so the family is uh, coping with that. So some of you may know um, Guru was his name. Um, so uh, she could not come. So I'm um, filling with, in for her, but um, it was really important uh, for us to, since this is a, a, a collaboration between AAAS, African and African American Studies, and us um, to, to, um, to um, share this event to, um, tonight, but um, she just called this morning. So um, therefore, it is my, now my great uh, pleasure and privilege uh, to introduce Professor Arthur Kaison. Uh, I had two years ago a conversation with my colleague uh, and friend Jonathan Boyarin, who um, some of you may know from his various uh, excursions into diaspora um, theory and critical studies, um, who mentioned this very cool guy from Toronto who's heading, um, and very nice guy, that's, the, that's how he described you, um, who you should absolutely bring to Stanford, uh, who's heading the um, Center for Di Diaspora and Transnational Studies at the University of uh, Toronto, where you've been since, I think, August 2005 as a director. So I'm very happy that you could come. Um, 
and uh, we both um, agree very much on the importance of comparative diaspora studies. Uh, Professor Kaison did his BA at the University of Ghana and took his PhD from Cambridge University in 1995. And he then went on to University of Oxford as a research uh, fellow returning to Cambridge in uh, 1995 uh, and became the fellow at the Pembroke College there and a member of the Faculty of English um, where he eventually became a reader in Commonwealth and Postcolonial Studies. So many of us at Stanford who double in Postcolonial Studies are very familiar with your work. He has published so widely in, on African le uh, literature and postcolonial studies that I'm not, not going to list it all. Uh, but there's a number of important uh, textbooks that come out of Oxford uh, Blackwell um, in 2000, Postcolonialism, Theory, Practice, and Pro or Process. Um, also, uh, now an anthology, um, 2007, on African literature, an anthology of theory and criticism. Um, and many more, and he also wrote the introduction um, and notes to the Penguin Classics edition of Nelson Mandela's uh, No Easy Walk to Freedom. And uh, the talk tonight is based on his current research, so I'm not going to say anything about that since we uh, hear about that on Oxford Street, Accra. Uh, but I will just also mention that um, Professor Kaisen was elected uh, to five-year term of the MLA, of the Modern Language Association's Executive Committee of the Division of Postcolonial Studies and Literature and Culture in 2008. And he's a fellow of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences in Decem since December 2005. So I'm so pleased that you could come from Toronto and I welcome you and please help me welcome Professor Kaisen. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, to Charlotte, uh, first of all, and to the Taub Center for inviting me here. I'm always pleased not to be obliged to talk to myself. So it's always a pleasure to have other people to share my thoughts with. Um, some years ago, I was reading Theodore Adorno's Minima Mor Moralia, which I quite like, and um, I came across as we know, it's a, a series of aphorisms. And one of them which stuck with me, and which I've, I've had to return to many times, and this is Adorno. It is also a part of morality not to be at home in one's own home. It is also a part of morality not to be at home in one's own home. Now, this uh, aphorism, I've returned to several times. In fact, my students are always obli obliged to meditate on uh, this Adornian aphorism. But I myself have returned to it from different perspectives at different times. In, with specific regard to this uh, research project, out of which this talk is drawn, I grew up in the city of Accra, where I spent my, my adolescence, and I left uh, as an early adult. And it was only roughly five years ago on returning to start to research the city in which I grew up, that I received the shock of the familiar. I didn't uh, realize, and, and the inception of the project itself is, is very funny, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to one side. Uh, it was only when I actually began interrogating this place where I grew up that I discovered how little I knew about it. I know more about Shakespeare than I know about the city in which I grew up. So the shock of the familiar, the fact that what I assumed to be commonsensical and familiar actually had a history, that simple things had histories, and that in fact uh, every little detail of uh, uh, Ghana's urbanization process was part of a larger historical, sociological, and economic discourse. What I'm going to do today is I'm drawing on one vector of uh, my research and it is going to be, as you'll soon find out, on the interpretation of urban scripts. Uh, but urban scripts as part of, of a contradictory, sometimes overlapping, sometimes contradictory, discourse ecologies, discourse ecologies. And I'll try to systematically uh, 
take you through my own process of uh, excite, excitement. One of the things that I've struggled with, uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm in literature, my, my, my specialis, specialism is literary studies. One of the things I've been struggling with getting into the field of urban studies generally is how to write or present my, my insights, my discoveries, in a way that will be uh, comprehensible to this new field, but at the same time not to suppress my absolute excitement and wonder at the shock of what I've just described as a familiar. It is not always that I pull it off, but hopefully you will be more forgiving. <clears throat> now, uh, Wole Shoinka, Nobel Prize, Nigerian Nobel Prize winner, has a play called The Road in which he presents us with a character called the professor. And now, the, the professor, Willy Schoenke's professor, presents us with a peculiar reading practice that is nonetheless emblematic of a social process in urban Africa. This is how we first encounter the professor in the play, a place called The Road, 1965. I'm reading the state directions. Professor is a tall figure in Victorian outfit. Tall, top hat, etc all threadbare and shiny at the lapels from much ironing. He carries four enormous bundles of newspaper and a fifth of paper odds and ends impaled on a metal rod stuck in a wooden rest. A, a chair stick hangs from one elbow and the other arm clutches a road sign bearing a squiggle and the one word, bend, Prof, professor. He enters in a high sta state of excitement, muttering to himself, Almost a miracle. Dawn provides the greatest miracles, but this, in this dawn, has exceeded its promise. In the strangest of places, God, 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 but there is a mystery in everything, a new discovery every hour. I am used to that, but that I should be led to where this was hidden, sprouted in secret from heaven knows how long, for there was no doubt about it. This word was growing. It was growing from earth until I plugged it. Now, Professor's extravagant, motley Victorian outfit is a marker of his previous middle class affiliation, but which, by the start of the play, he is obviously dissociated from. And in fact, the anachronism in, the, in his Victorian outfit being worn in 1965 in Nigeria is actually a hint of uh, the fact that he is uh, being styled as a cross between the Lord of the Underworld and uh, Fagan, the famous villain of Dickens's uh, Oliver Twist. At any rate, uh, uh, the professor's vigorous quest for what he calls the word, capital W, the spirit of which he tries to arrive at via the assemblage of a range of quotidian scripts, the bundles of newspapers, paper odds and ends, the, the squig, the, the, the root sign with the squiggle and the bend. Uh, his, his quest for the word uh, goes side by side with a hybrid interpretative mechanism that co combines a Yoruba semiotics with a quasi-Christian sensibility. Now this hybridity, this interpretative hybridity is going to be pertinent to much of the reading practices across urban Africa, which we shall elaborate in a moment. Now, what might be described as a hermeneutical delirium, because that is what actually the professor, a Schoenke's professor, expresses. The hermeneutical delirium expressed by professor and the other characters in Schoenke's play foregrounds a number of important dimensions of the relation between urban scripts and reading publics in contemporary Africa. The first one is that in Africa, Literacy occupies an ambiguous place within a world still largely dominated by orality. Now by this, I'm not subscribing to, there's a standard view in African studies that Africa is a place of orality. The proposition makes it a little bit more complicated than that. I'm not dis 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 disavowing the fact that Africa is a place of orality, but the fact that literacy has evolved in such a way as to occupy a position between orality and more uh, completely liter literate forms, such that what we find is that writing is often 
especially urban kinds of writing, as opposed to high literature, Wole Shoinka being one or Chidwa Achebe, is uh, actually performative of a certain repertoire, but it's a repertoire that encompasses both orality and literacy. And we shall have something to say about this repertoire, and we'll try to unpack it in terms of some of the scripts that we'll be looking at. So that's the first point, the fact that literacy occupies an, 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 uh, uh, an ambiguous place. The second point is of, of, uh, of uh, to be adduced from this uh, hermeneutical delirium is that the degree to which reading in urban Africa eludes the book, book capital B, rather being deployed for the interpretation of a variety of textual surfaces that are part of the urban fabric itself. In other words, to understand reading and readerships in Africa, we have to step outside the classroom, which is not normally what uh, literary sociologists uh, uh, think about when they are thinking about readers, reading publics. They are not thinking about people who are uh, partly educated and who are just uh, reading urban scripts. It is not insignificant also, that the entire action of Shrinkers the Road unfolds against the background of a wooden tailboard uh, taken from a broken down passenger lorry on which is scrawled the inscription, Accident Store, all parts available. The language quirk captured here is no mere accident, but signals the hybridized sensibility that is most forcefully expressed in pidgin English, something which we will have uh, something to say a little bit later. Pigeon English spoken by the motor car park, motor park touts in the play. Now, literacy's ambiguous place raises significant questions about reading, the things that are read, and the urban reading publics that have evolved over the, over the past several decades on the continent. And what I shall be doing is to speak in very broad terms about the discourse ecologies that can be found on Africa's streets, but focusing specifically uh, on Accra and indeed Oxford Street, which is what was in my title, but I'm going to be moving away from Oxford Street to encompass Accra in general. Now, first of all, a very brief history of Accra, just to contextualize the processes that lead to the scripts that I'm, I'm, I'm going to devote uh, my talk to. Accra was de declared the capital of uh, the then Gold Coast colony in 1877. Now, prior to 1877, the coast had been dominated by several European trading, trading posts, the Dutch, uh, the Danes. Uh, with specific regard to Accra, uh, the, day the British built the James Fort in 1642. The Danes joined them, sorry, no, the Dutch joined them with Asher Fort in 1649, and the Danes, moving further westward, joined the, the Dutch and the English with Christiansburg Castle in 1659. Now, one of the, the effects of these, uh, and these forts still exist, is that uh, they, uh, uh, the, the, one of the immediate impacts was that they created spheres of influence, different European spheres of influence, so much so that the historians actually call those parts of Accra British Accra, Dutch Accra, and Danish Accra. But the second thing is that uh, by the 1850s, the British had effectively uh, decimated the European competition via a series of treaties, Anglo-Dutch, Anglo-Danish treaties, by, by the 1870s, they had effectively bought the, the, the Dutch holdings uh, uh, across uh, the Gold Coast. And in fact, there's a larger history to this because they were also prosecuting struggles in Malaysia. There were, there were all kinds of trade-offs. So things happening in, for example, Malaysia impacted on what happened on the West African uh, coast, but we are not going to go into that. At any rate, 1877, Accra is declared the capital of the Gold Coast colony, and it immediately becomes a focal point of administration, uh, administrative, cultural, and social uh, processes. Uh, by the <coughs> early uh, 20th century, by the early 20th century, we're talking about the 19 teens, it was a magnet for migrants from across the hinterland, 
uh, northern territories, the east and the west. Now, remember that uh, for Africanists, this point I'm going to make is, is fairly obvious, that, uh, that these are multi-ethnic environments, multi-ethnic and multilingual. So one of the effects of rendering Accra the capital is that different ethnicities had to mix different languages. And the, this mixture of languages also forced a certain uh, uh, semiotic. A semiotic system evolved by which uh, different uh, uh, language groups try to project their languages onto the environment. At any rate, in terms of the evolution of the practice of writing or, or, or across the cityscape, the most important development was the introduction of the motor car. A motorized transport was introduced in a very small way into uh, Accra in the 19-teens. In fact, the first motor car was owned by the then governor, 1912. Very rapidly, it expanded. By, by the end of the First World War, the Americans uh, had uh, begun to carve out part of the market for Ford trucks, Ford trucks and vehicles. But the, the real turning point occurred after the Second World War, when from 1946, 47, the British began to introduce Bedford trucks. It was intensely competitive because uh, after the Second World War, the rebuilding, uh, post-war rebuilding, uh, motorized transport had a big uh, 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 as part of, of the, the nature and character direction of, of rebuilding. I tell you, the British introduced Bedford trucks, but they introduced the chassis, the, the, the trucks, engine and the chassis, without the body, so that the bodies had to be built upon the, the chassis locally. What then happened is that in the Sassiqui of Ghana, but this can be replicated across Africa, Zambia. People have done, made studies of this uh, development in Zambia, Nigeria, Sierra Leone. I think you're focusing on Ghana. What then happened is that the, the, the uh, locals built their bodies made of wood, but they had to decorate them. And in trying to decorate them, they then began to, initially it was a combination of motifs from folk tales. So you'd find a mermaid or the Sasabonsam is the devil figure, but often also combined, so they combine images with words, with scripts. Now one of the very early practices was to translate local proverbs. So proverbs sometimes written in the indigenous languages, and remember by this time it was highly multilingual, but often also translated into English. Now this is one example. Uh, this is from 1975. Still it makes me laugh, no time to die. Now this is the wooden, the, 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 the vehicle. The body, the Bedford itself is the truck, and, but the wood, wooden body has been put upon it. And this can be used to ferry uh, passengers or, if necessary, cargo. At any rate, this, uh, the, the need to decorate the bodies of these manufactured, uh, uh, put upon uh, uh, trucks also meant that the practice of writing became incorporated into the social imaginary as a necessity. So the decoration and writing. Some people have actually written something about these as moving, uh, not billboards, but moving artworks. And by the way, this practice is not exclusive to West Africa. You find it in India, Pakistan, where entire ghazals, uh, poems, entire ghazals are written on the vehicles, or in Latin America, Colombia, and so on and so forth. Uh, coming back to Ghana, However, one of the immediate effects of these uh, writings on the vehicles was that first of all, it provided a surface for transcribing uh, wise sayings, opinions, sometimes political opinions, and so on. But also, it also provided the example, in a way, it became exam exemplary for writing on the urban scape in general. So it didn't take long for the writing to be transferred from these uh, vehicles onto walls, people write on the 
in front of their houses, and so on and so forth, such that the urban scape became alive with scripts and writing. So that's point one. However, there, is, uh, there, there are certain, as I began to study this, I, saw, I sensed that there, was, there were certain methodological challenges. And so what I'm going to share a little bit before I go back to the nature of the, the slogans is uh, how do we deal with these things systematically? Because they, they are so multifarious. The first uh, methodological issue is the distinction between uh, stationary and mobile surfaces. There are stationary surfaces and there are mobile surfaces. Starting with the stationary. Now, stationary surfaces are any surfaces. They could be sign writing billboards. They could be what we would call graffiti in local parlance and so on and so forth. Uh, appropriated for, for writing anything. And, and the opinions vary. They could be profound and pithy sayings to just swear words, local swear words. However, uh, the, when you come to sign writing billboards, these billboards are used to promote and sell a range of goods and services. Uh, sometimes they're also used to uh, indicate uh, prohibitions, such as uh, urinating here is not allowed, A-L-O-U-D, very common, uh, you'll find, uh, and so on. But the, the more lively, this is my own view, the more lively slogans and scripts are to be found on the mobile service surfaces. Now the mobile surfaces cover a range of things. One is the trucks, the, the passenger lorries that we've seen. The second is actually push, push, uh, push cards. This coconut vendor's push card is appropriately decorated and he's written, save me, oh God. But that's not what is of interest. The interest is hard for you to see it from this angle is that he has a false number plate, B11X or something like that. Now, of course, re re reading what he has written in the context of the totality of the frame is that he's also staking a claim to usage of the road by providing himself a number plate which challenges, in a very mild way, the number plate of the Benz cars. And so we all, you know, uh, still it makes me laugh, no time to die. Uh, and not only that, in contrast to the big uh, uh, bank, United Bank billboard, which is uh, advertising uh, uh, cell phone, how you, you can transfer money through the cell phone. Now, so if you read this inscription in relation to the entire environment, urban environment, we see that the inscription is also staking a claim not just to the, the you know, ownership of the street, but a certain modality of understanding what it is to be, to live in the urban. Uh, so these are, this, this, is, this is an example of the uh, mobile surfaces. There are many uh, such, uh, such uh, uh, wise source. For example, I'm just giving you a, a handful. All the world is a stage, which by the way is, uh, is taken verbatim from Shakespeare's uh, uh, As You Like It. All the world is a stage and we are but players. Uh, but in the context of Ghana, all the world is a stage is not because we are, we are but players, but because we have to live our lives against the background of permanent transition. Which I think even Shakespeare did not think of that. So wait, <laughs> a permanent, so all the world is a stage. Or uh, Mama Chocolate, another favorite, uh, or uh, one of my, my very favorite is, a short man is not a boy, which by the way has some really subtle sexual innuendos, which I don't think we should delve into uh, amongst the uh, you know, female company. Uh, at any rate, uh, or um, inibre in the local language, inibre in soja, inibre in soja means envy does not light a fire. If I have something and don't have it, don't envy me because envy will not light your fire. Uh, or the zillions of these. Or uh, sometimes you also find uh, inscriptions combined with words. So uh, one example is on a barber shop uh, uh, billboard. You know, Obama 
side by side with Mike Tyson. The idea being that the two of them pack a mean punch. So if you want to be like them, you come in for a haircut. Very common. Or, or again on a billboard, shoes are repairing here to indicate the presence of a nearby uh, a cobbler. The point, though, is that we then find a zodiac of, of uh, sayings and, and slogans. One of the things that uh, I have found, which is a very common pitfall that people studying this phenomenon or phenomena uh, fall into, is the attempt to gather and typologize them. And some people have very fascinating typologies. So some are religious. Some are uh, with regard to witchcraft. Some are with regard to political slogans. However, I myself find that the typ typologizing impulse is ultimately futile. The simple reason being that these slogans cover every dimension of social and urban life. Not only that, they keep proliferating and changing such that um, you can find uh, slogans pertaining even to self-reflexively, even to the act of writing. So you see a slogan, I'm not writing this, but it is written. You know, I'm not writing this, so you two don't read it. Now, now if the typologizing of these uh, scripts is inadequate and ultimately to be, to be disavowed, what then do we make of it? Because we have to come to an understanding of the, the, the collective meanings, so what they are collectively performing. Now, what I want to suggest, I want to suggest a number of things. Uh, first of all, with regard to this song, this song is by a famous Ghanaian musician called Nana Kwame Mpedu. Now, Nana Kwame Mpedu sings a lot, of, he's very folksy. He sings a lot of folk songs. And what he does in this particular song is to sing in praise of drivers and their vehicles. But what he does then is that he gives, as the song proceeds, he gives a long list of vehicle slogans, some of which we see here. But the thing to notice about the vehicle slogans is that not all of them are in English. Oh, oh no, oh, I wish. Okay, we'll, we'll take it as background music. Uh, so the first thing to note is that the inscriptions are not all in English. Some of them are in, uh, for example, Cool and Collected, Lover Boy. Each of them is a different slogan. Envy No Man, Peudia, Peudia is in Akan. Or further down, if you see uh, Lolonyo, you know, like five from the bottom. Lolonyo is in a different language, it's in Eve. Uh, and then uh, there's also Hausa, it's a third language. Uh, uh, Insha'Allah, Akwe Allah, Allah exists. Now what this, remember that this is a song. What this song is doing is that it is producing a script of scripts. The song is, it's an oral, obviously it's being sung. It's producing a script of scripts, but it's a script of scripts in different languages. So it becomes, it performs an archivist function. He's singing as an archivist of these slogans. That's the first point. The second point is that, in fact, what he's doing is that by making the song a, a script of scripts, an archive of such slogans, he's actually making, giving suggestions for people to take these slogans. Uh, these, all these slogans actually exist. But by putting it together and, and making it into a song which becomes really popular, he's actually, in a way, providing a hint, a template for people to generate slogans from. The two points I want to take from this is that if the, 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 to understand the semiotic production or, or the roots through which the slogans are produced, we have to understand first 
the fact that they, they are often dependent on uh, intermediate transfers. So sometimes a song will be sung which itself, the, the, the refrain of the song would then become a slogan. Or a slogan will be so widely known or circulated that it could become the nickname of a, a television actor or actress. Uh, specifically with regard to Kwame Ampedu, there's a song that uh, he sang in 1969, and it was called A Binti Ye. Oh, sorry, this, there's something different. A Binti Ye, sorry, A Binti Ye. A Binti Ye, a Now, this song had to do with the animals in the jungle coming together for a big palaver about problems in the jungle. Now, as they are sitting, very democratic and all that, now as they are sitting, they find that the monkey, that the lion, the monkey finds himself sitting right in front of the lion, and the lion is resting his paw on the monkey's shoulder. So the monkey is uncharacteristically quiet. Now, as the animals are talking, they say, the monkey, he's quiet today. What's going on? So they ask the monkey, monkey, you don't have anything to say? The monkey says, I do have something to say. So what is it? He says, and then he says, some people are sitting well, but some are not sitting well at all. <coughs> That's what the monkey says. <laughs> but the key thing about this, in the local language, the, the word for to sit is the same as the word for to live. So actually, even though the song ostensibly was about the monkey not sitting well, it was about the monkey not living well. So it was very quickly interpreted as a critique of the then government in 1969. Some politicians are living very well and others are not living well at all. What might in the current context apply to Wall Street? You know, Wall Street versus the rest of us. What then happens is that the refrain of the song becomes it's uh, detached from the song itself and becomes a very popular slogan. You find it on, uh, on kiosks. You find it on motor vehicles. You know, everywhere you, you, you find this slogan, a BTA. But the point I want to make is that the, the route that it has taken, it has taken the route of the intermediate transfers. Thus, the literate form of the inscription on the bus has actually depended upon a certain relationship to forms of orality. I, I think this is the crucial point, that every inscription that we find has a hinterland. And each hinterland presents a different case study of the process of transmission and expression on that surface. It's for that I say that, uh, I suggest that the the typologizing impulse is ultimately to be disavowed because to just to list and categorize the, these uh, slogans is not to understand the processes of their becoming articulated as scripts. Another one that I want to, to touch upon, and then I'll, I'll leave this for the next point, is that there are many slogans that have to do with the celebration or the identifying of uh, urban phenomena. So for example, ashawo. Ashawo is the word for prostitute. So you find on the, on the, on the bus, ashawo. Or uh, more fascinatingly, mami dokono, or akpeteshi sela. Now mami dokono is uh, a local food. It, it's peasant food, but now who is a peasant? They're all dead. So everyone eats that food. Now, <laughs> the fascinating thing about so the, 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 the vehicle slogan is actually celebrating this food vendor. Hmm? However, the question is why celebrate the food vendor? But the reason to arrive at the reason, we have to take a small detour. Food vendors in much of urban Africa also have devised a really elaborate mode of the provision of credit, because many urban dwellers are poor. So they have to go and they borrow the food against their income, which is coming at the end of the month. 
However, there's a, 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 a modality, a cultural modality for borrowing food. And one of the things standard is that to get food on credit from the food vendor, you have to surrender a story. But the story is normally about something really bad happening in your life. You know, my kids, school fees, I cannot pay. Or my, my mother-in-law is always bothering me in asking me for money and so on. Gradually, these stories that this food vendor acquires become a disciplinary resource. In other words, the food vendor becomes a, a, a resource for discipline. The reason being that if you refuse to pay or you fail to pay, the story that you said, told about your mother-in-law will immediately find itself back into the community. <laughs> In fact, there have been tales told of uh, a, a recalcitrant uh, borrower suddenly finding himself the object of intense scrutiny by neighbors because a story that he told about either his wife or his mother-in-law uh, goes back into circulation. So actually, the slogan which is celebrating a food vendor is actually celebrating not just the food vendor, but an, an entire economic, com cultural nexus. Because the food vendor then provides credit, but it provides credit in a culturally specific way. Uh, so this, this takes me back to, to the proposition that these slogans, each of them has a very fascinating hinterland. So the significant thing is not just to identify the slogan, but to try and uh, understand the processes of the formation and transmission of uh, the slogans for them to become scripts. How much longer do I have? 10 minutes, okay. Uh, the, what I, 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 I'm going to really stop on the slogans. Uh, there's another, because the slogans represent one discourse ecology. There, there's another discourse ecology, because Accra is not just uh, these slogans. Accra is also these fascinating billboards. Each of them also, which when examined, reveal a hinterland of signification. However, this billboard, which is a, a cell phone advert, you can find it everywhere in Accra, attempts very scrupulously, it's a multinational corporation, by the way, they have branches all over the world. This is called Tigo. The Tigo billboard, one example, the Tigo billboard tries to sidestep local forms of cultural mediation in a way that uh, the other, the slogans don't, they can't, because they, they are produced via very intensely local forms of mediation. Uh, these uh, these uh, billboards, on the other hand, try to sidestep, you know, to disavow, to sidestep local forms of mediation, and instead produce certain transnational objects of desire. And, and there's much that I could say trying to unpack uh, this, uh, this particular uh, image, uh, from the fact that the, the uh, models are all fair-skinned, very fascinating, fair-skinned, the blue sky theme, the palm trees at the background, and so on, uh, even the clothes that they wear. Because what is really happening is that these uh, black uh, figures can be found anywhere in the world. They are not local to Accra. These figures could be found in New York, or Johannesburg, or London, or Milan. So that the idea of a transnational blackness in which ethnicity is separated from locality, talking about space. So it, the, 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 for, the, the force of this image is not that they're African, it's just that they're black. So that their blackness becomes itself an imaged commodity. It is commodified as an image and separated, severed from, from locality. So that you can find this, this, this the, so the, figure, the figures invoke a, 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 a black cosmopolitan chic. We can be found anywhere in the world, whether it's Milan or, or Nigeria or Johannesburg or New York. Now, the, the, but however, I also suggest in the longer version of the paper that the, this, uh, this image making 
is in dialogue. Because we have to understand that the, the discourse ecologies are in dialogue with one another. So that it, is, it would be a mistake to read the No Time to Die slogan as a process, separate, entirely separate from this, uh, this uh, image. This, this. And, but but the, the, the point of confluence, the point of confluence is that they are all contributing to the production of desire or desires, except that one, the process of one desire making is a process of, of emplacement, local emplacement, that is the slogans on the vehicles and so on, is a desire for a particular uh, emplacement which is indigenous, quote unquote, and, and traditional. Whereas this one is a transnational emplacement, but both of them speak to the desire for a certain kind of wisdom and self-making. There's more to be said on that, but I, I want to, to draw to, to a hasty conclusion. So what do we conclude? When I, I first started thinking about this, I happened upon uh, Deleuze and Guattari's uh, discussion of Kafka, uh, minority literature. And they say something fascinating in their discussion of uh, my, this is what they say about Kafka. They say that um, there are four functions of language, all of which contribute to the deterritorialization de de effect of minority discourse. Uh, this is what they say, the four, four functions. Vernacular, the vernacular function is, is maternal or territorial and is used in rural communities or rural in its origins. The vehicular, which is the second uh, category, is urban, governmental, and even worldwide language, a language of businesses, commercial exchange, bureaucratic transmission, and so on, a language of the first sort of deterritorialization. Referential language, so they've, they've given us vernacular, they've given us vehicular, and then give us referential language, referential language, language of sense and of culture, entailing a cultural reterritorialization. Then the fourth category is mythic language on the horizon of cultures, caught up in a spiritual or religious reterritorialization. The spatiotemporal, and this is, I think, the, the, the linchpin of the argument, the spatiotemporal categories of these languages differ sharply. Vernacular language is here. Vehicular language is everywhere. Referential language is over there, and mythic language is beyond. Let me repeat. The special temporal categories of these languages differ sharply. Vernacular language is here. Vehicular language is everywhere. Referential language is over there, and mythic language is beyond. The, the idea, you can see that clearly they are privileging vehicular language, because vehicular language is a language of what we might describe as globalization. It implies mobility. It implies the weaving between things. But I, I wonder if their theory will have uh, been somewhat different if they had grown up in Accra. Thank you very much. for uh, some questions and discuss discussion. Um, and then in a, few, uh, in a few minutes, we'll have some little snacks outside, reception, so um, questions and discussion. Somebody who was riding a state-owned, publicly-owned um, subway may choose to, to write something on it. 
be in the video or whatnot. And our advertisement folks, but it's not, they're not only in that kind of difference, the power relationship comes out very strongly in public way of transport. Um, and especially as you showed this billboard, right? You should also not be, it should be owned by someone else. Mm -hmm. There, There is kind of a standardized, standardized form of communication. If you wanted to make it your own, you would have to deface it or change it in some way. Um, could you talk more about the relationship right, between, between property ownership and expression, particularly because the, the cities you've talked about have such a high portion of, of relatively indigenous people mm -hmm. owning even a push cart would be a sign of that's actually a very good question because, in fact, uh, as a rule, uh, uh, publicly owned transport, you know, because they are public transport, don't have any inscriptions. They are, you, you just have the name of the company and that's it. They are not likely, very unlikely. They may have a sticker here and there, but it's, it's so rare for them to have a full slogan, you know, uh, all the world is a stage uh, on, on it. So, which also means that as they enter, as the, the, the vehicles enter into the domain of the public sphere, they sever themselves, they distance themselves from the local cultural mediation. You know, because the, the government vehicles or the government, those who plan these things, don't consider these objects the objects of, uh, of uh, they, they are part of uh, uh, bureaucratic rationality, which tries to be objectively distantiated from that form of mediation. That doesn't mean that there's no cultural mediation, but the cultural mediation is not around the inscriptions. So this is actually a very good point. Whereas, without, almost without exception, the privately owned vehicles will always write something on it. It's almost like a branding. Uh, and, the, and the cleverer you are, in fact, it is not uncommon for the vehicle to be known by its slogan. So uh, I saw the the uh, I saw a world, the world is a stage. In fact, the owner of the, this the world is a stage was was uh, uh, married to a cousin of us, older cousin of mine, and that is what they called him. That's in fact I, we used to call him Uncle the World. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. We used to call him Uncle the World. <laughs> his slogan became his name. I have up to this day I don't know what it was called. It was called Oh Uncle the World. The world is a stage. Was his, he, he had six of those tracks, and all of them had the same inscription. The world is a state. They were, so we all call uncle the world. So this is actually a good point. So actually what we're seeing is the separation between the public sphere and the private sphere, where the private sphere is customized via a particular form of cultural mediation, whereas the public sphere attempts to distantiate itself from that form of uh, cultural mediation such that it becomes objective. Of course, it cannot escape. And there are forms by which the locals incorporate it back. But the incorporation is not via the inscription. So thanks for that question. So it was called Uncle the World. Yes. It's a polyphony. Remember, it's multilingual, so there are lots of languages, and lots of languages trying to project themselves onto the urban scheme. So it's a polyphony of, of discourses and languages. But in certain historical uh, contexts, when people feel that they cannot, there was a period when Ghana was under a, a, a military regime, and it was not that easy to you know, articulate oneself. 
you found slogans that were, they were ambiguous, but everyone knew that they were saying something about the, uh, about the government. So there was one who said, they say we should, sh we should keep quiet. They say we should keep quiet. It's a slogan. He's driving his car. He has his slogan. What is it? Who is they? We don't know. But we all know that this is true. At that time, it wasn't that easy to, to, to speak. Or uh, one that would say something like, um, uh, plenty money day, soldier line. Actually, this is a song. Plenty money day, soldier line. Now, plenty money day, soldier line. Soldiers used to sing it about women. So it's come to, the, uh, to us as military men because plenty money day, soldier line. Plenty money day, soldier line becomes a slogan during a military regime. <laughs> now, if you stop this driver and say, why have you written this? It's a song. It's a song that we sing. Play the Adwa, eh, plenty money, they so they like. But in the context, it's a form of political criticism, very subtle. So given different political context, in fact, recently, this is uh, about a year ago, another, this actually did not become a slogan. It was, I think it may be, um, it was a, a young man sang a song about things smelling. But he gives and he itemizes a long list of things that smell like a, a man's socks smells. People who don't wash in the morning, they smell. Everyone suddenly started reading that the smell that he was talking about was government corruption. So the incumbent government tried to buy the song off him. <laughs> yes, so the government itself uh, decided that this has something to do with that. So they tried to buy it off him. Of course, they, he didn't. He refused to sell it. He refused. It. They said they wanted to use it as a, as their theme song. Yeah, they wanted to use their theme song for their political campaign, and he refused. And of course, and then the word went round that the government was worried that uh, this was so. So there is polyphony, but given certain configurations, it is also a political act just to speak in this way. But it's coded. So if you stop this guy who has written this inscription, and says, no, it's a song. You didn't ban the song. Why are you banning me from writing the slogan? Yes. sensibility, especially during apartheid era. It wasn't uh, uncommon to see slogans which had specifically to do with apartheid, anti-apartheid slogans, so free Mandela, very common. You know, so, you, so you see a vehicle, free Mandela, and then the, if the front would be uh, free Mandela in front, and the back you see Winnie Mandela too. <laughs> you know, uh, so, so that, but not only that, uh, you know, uh, Rastaman vibration, for example, which is a song, Bob Marley song, very common. So you see on the vehicle Rastaman vibration. Or Queen Elizabeth II. Yeah, it's a slogan. <laughs> no, Princess Diana. <laughs> slogan. A Princess Diana. Uh, Obama is hot. I mean, all over Africa, people are naming their kids after him, naming doors after him. Slogans also. I haven't seen, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was a, a, a slogan uh, somewhere, Obama. So now, of course, these speak to a, a, a more uh, international. The Pan-Africanist ones are actually very interesting because there are lots of Pan-Africanist slogans which were specifically about things uh, which were happening elsewhere, but from a specifically African diaspora perspective. Yeah. Uh, there, there's another area that I haven't touched on is uh, religion. Oh, Israel. Plenty. Come on. Uh, Jacob's Ladder. You find Jacob's ladder. And as for God and Christ and Jesus, plenty. In fact, another dimension that I, that I didn't go into is that from 1975 to now, the, the essential character of these slogans collectively has tilted more and more 
towards uh, Christian Christianity. And that is because of the rise of the evangelical churches. That's another discussion altogether, which has, has altered in, in terms of the ratio of, I collected 350 uh, slogans in 2007. Of the 350, uh, over 50% were uh, religious, in one sense or the other. In 1975, the uh, no, no Time to Die, uh, this was the cover of a book of photographs uh, based on slogans. Of the 117 that they collected, just 13 had any religious theme. So the shift from 1975 to, to 2007 were less than uh, you know, 10, 15% to now over 50%. It has to be accounted for. So that is, so there is that. Uh, the second question was, uh, remind me again. The high literature. Now the high literature, now this is a big deal. It's a big issue because as a rule, the high literature has not, unfortunately, paid attention to this form of demotic polyphony. That's how I'll put it. The demotic polyphony opened who? Chino Achebe. Chino Achebe has done something in the sense that he has infused his writing with Europe, uh, sorry, Igbo uh, forms, proverbs. But in terms of what is happening in the urban and, and, and the polyphony of the urban, Shoyinka has, has you know, sort of touched on it, but just in that play. You know, people like uh, Ben Okri also have, to, not consistent, there's no, we don't have the kind of uh, the urban chronicler uh, who really talk about the African urban in the way that will produce an image of uh, London, for example. Like, I recently watched uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes, uh, the Downey Jr., and, uh, which I quite liked. So I went back to read Sherlock Holmes. And it was amazing how uh, heavily saturated in the speciality of London. Now rereading it, the, the mysteries that, that Sherlock was, was solving was no longer interest of interest to me. But the fact that this is actually a text about London, about the speciality of crime inserted into London itself. Africa, we don't have that yet. You know, we don't have a chronicler of the urban that will invoke the urban in such a way that, so I'm reading Sherlock Holmes and then boom, I'm thinking of London. And I'm, I'm following uh, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson across certain streets which I'm familiar with. You don't find that. So uh, the, Af the high literature has um, not paid enough attention to these, for definitely not, sadly. associated with vehicles. There's no doubt about it. Uh, so you find it uh, inscription on people's houses, you find it on, uh, on, uh, on uh, you know, vendors that carry uh, headpans, for example, you find an inscription, but it's more likely to be f projected onto vehicular objects, objects that are on the move. And clearly these are, they come to, beca they become signatures. They become signatures. Signatures 
Oh, there's another aspect of, of the, my, dis, my, my research, which I, I didn't want to go into, it's too complicated, is, is how collectively, collectively as opposed to individually, they are also providing us a transcript of transition. That is to say, the idea of transition as such. Since, uh, what, first of all, they are captured on moving surfaces, and secondly, taking together and mapping them, linking them together, the space that they, they create is not a space that a space that is stable because it is often the translation of uh, of uh, local language wisdom into English, or the conflation of English with pidgin English. Or so, in other words, even the inscriptions uh, they they denote a lot of uh, movement intrinsic, inherent to the scripts themselves. Never mind as. Uh, as impositions on, on moving surfaces. So what I, I, one of the suggestions that I try to make is more, more difficult to speak to than to write, is that uh, in fact, collectively, they are part of the social imaginary of transition. So, but the, the transitionality, but why, trans, why does transitionality become so important? And I think the transitionality, transitionality is so crucial for a number of reasons. One is that, of course, People want to move on. They want to get on. But the second thing is that there is also an idea that, uh, that the world, the, especially the post-colony, you know, the post-independence post-colony, is an object not just in formation, but it's fragile. It's inherently fragile. You know, a little bit of digression. Uh, Can Canadians recently, they all went crazy because uh, the ice hockey team beats the American ice hockey team. I was quite excited to see this kind of nationalist feather. Now, my friends from Europe were sort of thinking, these Canadians, they're a new country. That's why they are singing, they, they sing the national anthem at school, for example, every morning. Now, as I began to think about it, I said, you know, Coming from Africa, I know how fragile the nation state project is. So we're, we're up to the Canadian. It's good to celebrate the nation. You know, in post-colonial or globalization studies, they say the nation is finished. You know, all that we need is the market. Nation, forget about the nation. It's not entirely true. So back to the, the, the transitionality idea. I think one of the things that the transitionality idea is capturing inherent to the process, the practice of scripting itself, is the idea that, in fact, if we don't impose our own uh, scripted wisdom on this urban scape, this entity is so fragile that it will vanish and leave us holding sand. That's how I interpret it. So there's, there's a desire to impose your meanings as much as possible, especially in the private sphere, private sphere in position, because the public sphere thinks that so whereas the state thinks that it is permanent, the denizens of the state think that it likely is not. Because everything that it does, <laughs> a friend of mine says that uh, African governments all behave like non-governmental organizations. Uh, they have projects, you know, as opposed to plans. <laughs> so, yes, yes. Yes. Stage name. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, the body is a body silent. In relation to these uh, script, urban scripts, the, the, at least in Ghana, it's body silent. Tattooing is not a big, big deal in, in much of Africa. In fact, until I went, came to the West, I was surprised that people actually thought that tattoo was an art form, tattooing was, was art. 
which I now am, am, am marginally persuaded, uh, especially certain parts of the body where they impose the tattoos. Uh, uh, tattooing in, in Africa has had to do with two things. One is religion, religion. So there are some religious uh, sects that require forms of tattooing. Uh, uh, tattooing also was historically related to you know, uh, traders. Many trading women tattooed their names and perhaps their, their, uh, uh, their passbook numbers on, in case something happened to them, you, you would know where, so they would tattoo their name and the town where they came from. So it's very connected to trading networks, tattooing. So in other words, it has a purely functional uh, role as opposed to aesthetic. So it's very rare in, in at least definitely in Ghana, to find someone with some fancy tattoo all over their body, it's, it's, not, it's not common. So the body is silent in that respect. In terms of uh, T-shirt slogans, of course, you find that everywhere. But what you also find is that many of these T-shirts, the slogans are not local slogans. So you find, you find Nike. You find some slogan which has uh, <laughs> one, one, one. Of course, because I'm, I'm, I'm studying these things, I pay attention a lot. So a T-shirt I saw in Accra once, it says, no, big one. No, slightly smaller. No, a little bit smaller. Uh, well, maybe. <laughs> you know, so I don't know what that was about. But <laughs> no, no, no. Ah, uh, well, maybe. So you find that, but these uh, t shirts are not, because the key thing is whether they have been routed through the local cultural forms of mediation. And clearly, these t shirt slogans are, they have nothing to do with the local. So you do, but I would say my answer is that, the short one, my answer is that the body is relatively silent in relation to its bearing the uh, inscriptions uh, compared to the vehicle, this, this body silent. Between 
slogans that uh, are used as monitors for oneself mm -hmm. when you are seeing a certain, for example, this bus going, mm -hmm. or, or, uh, this uh, this vehicle mm -hmm. going down the street, you associate this with a particular individual as opposed to those that are sort of belonging to the, the common um, well, some, some, the process is complicated. In fact, as I said, the uh, underworld, world, yeah, underworld, uh, you know, yeah. under world, uh, you know, the world is a stage. Everyone knew that the world is, those vehicles were owned by him, so it became uncle world. It's not so easy to, because, um, so, so right now, this vehicle, it's a passenger vehicle, speaking of people. There's no uh, clear, necess necessarily, for the people along the street that it is flying, the roads that it's flying. For them to know that, first of all, who owns the vehicle, uh, whether it's the driver, is driver owned, or the driver is driving on the behalf of someone else. Th those, those factors are ones that, they can be found out very easily because uh, often they, each of these uh, uh, lorries have what they call a lorry park. So you can actually track, so if you want to find Uncle World, you go to a particular lorry park, you can ask. So where does the world is a state normally pick up passengers? And you go and you find Uncle World. <laughs> but that's, that's a different kind of process. So it's not um, collective in that sense. It's more, no matter how much the inscriptions have a public, uh, you know, villains, they are really private. Uh, they are public only in the sense that they traverse the public sphere and create talking points, points of recognition, and so on for the public. But they're actually uh, uh, carving a, 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 a space for, for private sentiment. That's how I would say. And it's not a Tigo, MTN, Vodafone. Vodafone recently came to the country and so on. The first thing is that um, they are, the, the thing is we must recognize, we must note that these uh, billboards, Tigo, MTN are, 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 and others, they want to generate an image which is not localizable. I think that's the key thing. They, they resist localization. They do not want to be mistaken for something that is entirely local. So if um, you took their service, their service is giving you connectivity to something that even though you will be using the service locally, that is not the objective of the cell phone company. In fact, this image, I investigated, I, I interviewed the, the, the company that put the images together for, for Tigo. The company itself is based, it's called Creative Eye. They're based in Dar es Salaam. The company that put the thing together, they are based in Dar es Salaam. They flew the models over from different parts of, of the world. They are not even African. And they flew them to Bangalore. The, the photo shoot was done in Bangalore. The photo shoot is done in Bangalore. It's sent to the Creative Eye head office in Dar es Salaam. And Dar es Salaam produces what they call a generic form. And that generic form is then farmed out to their bases in Africa. So, so it is not in their interest to, to make it Ghanaian, you understand? So, so I think the first thing, the same with MTN, MTN or Vodafone, what they want is to, they resist localization. Even when, um, because the, this Tigo campaign has passed, they now have a different campaign. The images have changed. In fact, they, they look more Ghanaian and so on. But the point is that they only look local to the degree that you are positioning yourself as a consumer of a product that is not necessarily local. So, the, and there are different uh, mechanisms by which they attempt to sidestep the local. One is by, by, by this generic image making. And by the way, there's also another fascinating aspect to this uh, image made in Dar es Salaam. And that is that one of the things that I discovered when I interviewed the, the company, uh, the local representative, 
was that the brief of Creative Eye was to create an image of Pan-African youth. This was specifically their brief. I mean, Kwame Nkrumah and Abdul Nasser would turn in their graves. Because what they meant by Pan-African youth is that it's an image of blackness that any black person, anyone in the world can be identified, can identify with. It doesn't need to be African. So that was the idea of a Pan-African youth. So what they then did, but it is interesting that the, the uh, creative eye in Dar es Salaam chooses this format because Dar es Salaam itself is a highly hybrid uh, area, uh, very much saturated with uh, Indians and Persians for, from at least the 15th century. That part of East Africa has been very much saturated with people from other parts of the world. And uh, in the uh, 19th, 20th century, uh, Indians indentured labor from India, India. And as we know, by the late 70s, there was a victim diaspora where they were hounded out and they spread all over the world. So of course, to ask Creative Eye, which is headed by uh, an Indian of uh, uh, East African, an East African of Indian dis the, the descent, to produce a Pan-African, an image of Pan-African youth, to him, what are you asking him to do? So this is what he produces. at least sidestepping the look. Notice there are other things that we can notice. Notice the uh, CK, Calvin Klein, of the, the, the young woman on the right. And this woman with a spiky punk, you know, with that, that uh, striped uh, T-shirt was very popular in 2006. It was the, the, you know, emblem of the summer. So urban chic. There's another one of these images where the person in front has an Abercrombie and, and Fitch T-shirt. You know, how much, how more urban can you get? Abercrombie and Fitch, big one, and he's also doing the V. The point of it is that you are supposed to identify with them locally, but identify with them in such a way as to make you, to show the sign that you are also a transnational consumer. That the fact that you, you are taking Tigo products in Accra doesn't mean that you couldn't be in New York taking the same products. The, first, the second thing is that we must also understand that Ghana has spawned a large uh, diaspora, quote unquote, where uh, mixed race, uh, now the, the mixed race uh, progeny, or Africans born uh, outside the homeland, now constitute quite a sizable and influential uh, uh, cohort or, or constituency. So that this image will also speak to that constituency. Uh, which constituency has clout, it has uh, influence, and so on, so that uh, location or localization, of course, it's important. Capitalism needs locality. There's no doubt about it, because locality is marketable. But ultimately, it wants to convert the local into an instantiation of the global. That's its ultimate objective, is that wherever HSBC, the local bank, what are they talking about? You know, the, the big HSBC advert, the bank, your, your favorite local bank, the, wor no, sorry, the world's local bank. And the reason is, that's what they say. This is, this is the slogan of HSBC is the world's local bank. What they want to do is that they want you to be fully immersed in the local, but to think that you are not local. Because that's the point. The point is that they require you, they don't want global capitalism doesn't want all Pakistanis to move to Silicon Valley. They want Pakistanis to stay in Pakistan, but to imagine that they are consuming, by consuming products made in Silicon Valley, they're also of the global world.
fascinating discussion. So uh, we have uh, refreshments outside, and so there's more opportunity to um, talk uh, and discuss, and then the participants will be shepherded off eventually to dinner. <laughs>